but Peyton got to the point where pornography was a need in my life. And it was something that I had to have to be able to, to live. And when I got to that point, it was like, what, what's the point in living anymore? My name is Smith Alley. I'm 18 years old. I uh, just turned 18 this year. I'm a senior. I love to play lacrosse. I love everything that has an engine in it. Like if it has an engine and wheels, I'm in. Dirt biking, motorcycles, cars, I love it all. I love to get my hands dirty. It's a very, definitely a very loud bike. <laughs> so. I like to call myself a wounded healer. So I, I've been hurt and now, and now I like to heal people. I truly believe that this generation has so much potential and a lot of it's being wasted right now. And so I'm trying to get youth especially to like step out of their, of their comfort zone, to push themselves, to become the person that they wanna be and ultimately to take care of themselves because a lot of them, um, a lot of us youth aren't right now. Growing up in school um, was, it, it, was an, it was interesting. I had a stutter when I was little that was really bad. I remember introducing myself the first day of the first grade and I had stuttered. I was like, ah, I'm, my name's Smith. And I sat down and I was super flustered and angry and embarrassed and this girl turns around and looks me straight in the eye she, she was on the red table. I even, I even remember the colors of the tables. And she says, why can't you talk right? And I remember after that first day of like, getting made fun of for my stutter, I decided I'm gonna make fun of myself so that no one else does. I was nine years old when I was first exposed to pornography. And my parents were like the woke parents in the neighborhood. Like they had all the conversations, we had the filters, we had everything like that. And I remember thinking back on those conversations and remembering, turn it off and tell an adult, right? We've all heard that. I still thought that my parents would be disappointed or ashamed in, uh, of me because of what I had seen and so I didn't tell them about the experience then. Then about nine months to a year later, it, it came back into my life and I started using it for, I think, what a lot of people use it for. And it, it, it was a drug for me. It was a way that I dealt with all of those small things that I was, I was feeling. And it led to the most vicious, self-loathing, self-hatred cycle that I've ever been in. A lot of these things earlier in my life, like, you know, being asked why I couldn't talk right, being the chubby kid, all of those things just planted a little seed of doubt and pornography and social media just fed on that big time ripped me apart, just exposed all of my insecurities. Everything that was inside got worse because of porn. It took this kid who, who didn't think that he deserved love to a, a kid who, who didn't think that there was love for him. I remember sitting in, in school, I was in my shop class, and I made a plan to take my life. It all, um, was based on the fact that I didn't want my parents to, to find me. I didn't, my parents are such good people and I didn't want them to have to walk in and see me dead there. <laughs> That's so, as a kid, I, I, I remember that like not wanting them to go through that pain. And this is why Fight the New Drug has such a special place in my heart. I, I found, I found Fight. And I remember being this little kid and reading this research that, that they had done and the, the brain heart world and all these things and I realized that I'm not a bad person. For the first time, I realized that yeah, I'm not a bad kid, I'm a good kid who's, you know, enslaved by this content that's a drug.
Then in April, April 23rd, 2018, I got into my first run-in with the law and that, that is what kind of let everything fall apart, right? So my parents found out about that, the police contacted them, and then everything just laid out there. That same day, I'm laying in my bed about to go to sleep. I remember just wondering what my world was gonna look like, not knowing um, if I'd be able to go to the college that I wanted to or be able to do you know, all of these things that, um, that I thought my life was supposed to, you know, I thought that's where I was supposed to go. And my mom came down to me that night and she just grabbed my face right as I was going to bed. And she said, Smith, I will fight for you, but you have to fight for yourself first. And that was the true pivot point. And it was that day where I decided that no matter where I had been, I was going to become this person that I wanted to be. So Smith had had a, had a run in with the law and I kind of had this emotional um, whirlwind for about an hour. And then, um, and then my mind came to clarity of what my, sorry, of what my son had been dealing with for several years on his own. But, you know, I grabbed his face, I wanted him to hear me, grabbed his face and I said, you know, I will fight for you, Smith, but you have to fight for yourself. I, I can't do this for you. You know, little did I know that that was such a changing moment for him. Uh, he talks about how originally he has thought that it was fear that, that helped him make some changes, but later he realized that it was love. I stopped living in fear because I had realized that living in fear had, had almost destroyed me. Living in fear had brought me to the point of death, right? And I, I couldn't do that anymore. It just wasn't an option. I had to be, I had to be fearless and I had to be confident and I had, I had to fight. So I have a company called Protect Strong. Um, I saw this huge gap today where parents, my parents, grew up not knowing technology, but they had to parent me who only knew the, the digital era. I flipped that script and now I help parents set up their tech safely, know how to monitor it, know how to use all the software that they have, and then talk about important conversations that they should be having with their kids. These are like all the notes that I get. Um, it, I don't know. It's really hard because you hear a, a lot of like sad stories doing this, but at the same time, like this, this kind of just makes it worth it. And it's good motivation. Yeah, it's cool. There's a lot of these that, that mean a lot to me. The reason that I do what I do, you know, I, I really think that it stems back to at a point in my life, I, I really needed some help from, from other people and, and I got it. I got to a point where I was happy in life and I felt so good after recovery and after going through all these steps, bettering my mental health. And I didn't want to keep that to myself, you know? I, I felt like that would be selfish. I think there's a lot of hope out there. And I hope that, you know, I've always shared my story, not because I like talking about myself. Um, the only reason I've done that is to, is to hopefully you know, someone can see themselves, just a little bit of themselves and a little bit of me. And I hope that that's, that's a part of hope. And I hope that, you know, the reason why I'm doing this, I, I believe the reason why Fight the New Drug does this is to share stories so that people can find hope in them. Um, and that's, that's what I want from this. I want people to know that they can turn their life around. I want people to know that they are not their actions. They are not their thoughts that you can become the person that you want to be.